Hey, hey, hello everyone, and welcome to another week, another, oh, it looks like I'm clipping a little bit, let me lower that a little, uh, welcome to another week under lockdown, I was walking around Miami uh, last night, and I was wondering, why is there no one out, and then I saw a sign that told me that we are under quarantine still, from 8 a.m., from 8 p.m. till 6 a.m., so when I went for my evening walk at 9 p.m., uh, I was the only one on the street, so kind of crazy. Uh, I hope uh, everyone's doing better than Miami's doing. Uh, thanks for those of you who've already said hi. If you're just joining us, please say hello where you're from. Let me know um, if this is your first time. If not, I probably recognize you. Today, we're going to talk about uh, creating demand. We're going to kind of jump topics. Um, I did my interview with uh, Maxwell Finn uh, yesterday in the pursuit of trying to get at uh, entrepreneurial expert intuition. Um, I would say that it was a failure as it relates to that. Um, got a lot of interesting information about Max's history. I'm going to have to listen to it again and see if there are opportunities now to break it apart. But one thing that was interesting, um, which I think is kind of a pattern, and I wanted to kind of tell you guys about that, uh, the um they that um maxwell had kind of gone from an agency started an agency um then went to doing performance based and now he's doing a lot more of his own stuff and if you kind of think about it when you're doing an agency you're getting an override right you're getting paid to kind of do um when you go to performance based you're now not getting paid to do but you have um, much more upside. You get paid based on your performance. And then agency, when it's completely your own product, obviously you're getting paid based on your own performance, but you keep the long-term benefits. And it's just an interesting way of kind of proceeding. It's very, to me, it's very similar to getting paid the, like announcing a coaching program, getting paid to do the coaching program, have the coaching program become a product after that fact, be able to sell it, grow it, like, you know, in a similar way, like getting paid to create the product. And that's primarily why I've always been a huge fan of create a service to create the product so that you get paid to create the product. Um, but that's not what today's about. Today is about creating demand and all this uncertainty, all this unrest, uh, has, uh, got me thinking about the economy and what's really going to happen. And, and while no one can know for sure, and I did give a presentation, uh, this past Sunday night to, uh, a bunch of Japanese entrepreneurs, um, to our subscribers of Steel, our winners in Japan, um, and about, you know, how to market best in times of uncertainty. And that's not what we're covering today. What we're covering today is a presentation I gave in Japan about a year and a year, year and a half ago um, on creating demand. And when in 2008, uh, after the financial crisis, a lot of gurus found themselves in trouble. Uh, I was not one of them. I helped a lot of them. Uh, and that was primarily because the market contracted, because credit card limits contracted. And because credit card limits contracted, and most people buy information type products more often than not on their credit cards, the market, the spending power of the market contracted. And, and so while there's never going to be a day, I don't think, where all customer demand disappears, we certainly... Um, have benefited from very high levels of demand for very long periods of time that have been somewhat unsustainable. We'll see if it continues or not. Depends, I guess, on economic policy. But um, but for sure, uh, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that consumer demand will probably be less in the years to come for some period of time. Uh, maybe not for us online, but certainly worldwide um, before things maybe get back to normal and who knows when that will be. Um, you know, I've kind of been here in this apartment in Miami for about two and a half weeks. Um, came down to visit a friend. I think I've seen him like three times. So I am actually going to head up to Delray, uh, tonight and I'm going to broadcast 
uh, from my house on Thursday. I'm really looking forward to that. I haven't been to my house in a long time and no one is there right now renting it. So I get to go. Um, and so I'm excited about that. So let's say hello to everyone that's joined us. Then we'll dive into the presentation. I've just pulled up my slides from Japan. And uh, as always, uh, I appreciate it if you uh, tell others about uh, the uh, this live stream. I'm not going to say the word. Uh, or you react in... Uh, any kind of way, whether that's uh, happy faces, hearts, or what have you, or just comment. Um, the more that you do that, the more that this uh, live stream gets organic growth. And that is your way of thanking me for doing these, for taking the time to share the message. Obviously, I don't sell anything here. Uh, I'm doing this really as a way to connect bond with people and share what I know that maybe others don't know. So I appreciate those hearts and thumbs up. So, hey, Milos, always good to see you and always good to see you here. Uh, hey, Bill, nice to see you as well. And James, uh, very nice of you to be here as well, James. And Carlos, as always, from Venezuela and Logan. Good to see you, uh, <laughs> and thank you for being here in advance, or you're here already, so I can't, I guess, say that. Hey, Chris, um, there is a significant throughout the world, however, some world economies are doing far better than others. Yeah, you know, but who knows? I don't even trust the news. We went over that. Uh, Got to be careful. They're going around, they're going people for, they're getting people for walking around at night, apparently. Um as soon as I realized that, I walked back to the, the apartment, but it just felt nice to get the hell out of this place for a limited amount of time. Mohammed had no comment, just a enter. Uh, we got Jason from Tampa. Hey, Jason. And we got Jeff from South Africa. And we have Kayvon from Vancouver. And we have Jesse. Hey, Jesse. Uh, from Newport Beach, California. And we have Richard from Santa Barbara. And we have Hugo from Miami. Yeah, Hugo, I didn't know that there was a quarantine. A, is it a quarantine? What is it called? A curfew from 8 p.m. till 6 a.m. Uh, Amit from India. Joey, uh, West Palm Beach. I was watching a CSIB bonus video today, and you mentioned that you asked all your past mentors where they learned from Kennedy, Abraham, et cetera. And they almost all had the same lineage of information going back to one person. You didn't say who that person was. I was curious who that person was. Oh, Dan Rosenthal. That's who it is. That's who uh, Jay Abraham first heard about scientific advertising and Claude Hopkins and people of that elk. Um, that is the agency that Gary Bensavenga worked for. That's who Clayton Makepeace worked for. Um, and yeah, so Dan Rosenthal, uh, here on Coronado Island. Yeah. Newport beach. Uh, <laughs> Andrew from New Jersey is here. Glad to have you here. Um, and, uh, Tim Kreft. Nice to have you here, Tim, from Idaho, and Ron Williams from Champaign, Illinois, uh, birthplace of the internet, and Ulrich is from Boston. Good to see you, man, and that smile with that coffee. Andres Bahaman, really excited about this live stream. I watched your video about how to create demand in SOW. Brilliant. Oh, cool. I'm glad you did. Um, very cool. Uh Mike Paul, good stuff. Hey, Rich, tuning in from Washington, D.C. Hey, Jane, good to see you. Hey, Leon from New York's holding down the fort in New York City. Uh, is Leon, I'm interested if New York City is getting better. Like um, right now in Miami, like you can't even walk on the sidewalk. Like a woman, I went to the beach on Saturday. It was drizzling. I figured it was safe for me to take off my mask because like there was literally like several hundred feet between me and the next person. And some woman comes running across the beach to tell me that I need to put a mask on. And I was telling her that she was uh, violating my six feet. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't know if you have to wear a mask when you walk down the street in the city. But like I understand walking in stores. But I mean, that seems a little crazy to me. Uh, good evening to Tayo or Teo from Nigeria and Ankit from Toronto. 
And Don from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, well, that's good news, Don, that your uh, offline business is keeping you really busy. That's a that's the best reason of all not to be here. Uh, it is Rosto from Slovakia, Eastern Europe, and Mina from Paris. Hello, Mina. And Nikolaj, am I sp- saying that right, Nikolaj, uh, from Norway? And Francisco from Spain. And Denise from New England. And uh, Tammy from Michigan. COVID is in a much better place in New York City at this point. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> Very cool. Although I'm not really crazy about everyone praising Cuomo with the amount of deaths that we had. Doesn't seem like he did that great of a job. Uh, whoops. All right. Let's now dive in to this. Uh, it's going to be a crazy election, isn't it, though? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. It should be interesting at the very least. All right. So uh, you guys ready? Ready for uh, I haven't put up. the. Well, I guess I shouldn't really put up the thing for the. Um, uh for the Facebook group, but you know what? Let me put on the Facebook group for a minute here and then uh, we will. No, let's steal our winners. I guess we can put that up for a second and put the Facebook group here for a minute and I'll just talk for a minute or two and then we'll dive in. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I will. Uh, this is for those of you who are, I guess, more than curious. So I spoke to a friend of mine um, named Ryan uh, Bello. And Ryan uh, owns a company called Cortex Labs. He's one of the most knowledgeable nootropics guys that I know. And uh, I haven't been in the best place recently. I've kind of been struggling with a low-grade depression. And I've just been feeling very unmotivated. Uh, I don't know if that's because I haven't been around a lot of people and I generally get energy from people or what it is. But um, so I asked him if he had any recommendations. He made a recommendation. uh, 9-ME-BC. It's a research chemical. I am not endorsing this, nor am I saying you should try it. Um, There are risks involved. It's a research chemical. But uh, I tried it yesterday. Um, I do a lot of experiments on myself. and, uh, And holy crap. Uh, it's helped me quite a bit. And, uh, so it's nine dash M E dash B C it's not made for human consumption. It's only been tested on animals. Um, but it's, uh, it regenerates, uh, dopamine receptors in the hippocampus. And, uh, if you've done a lot of drugs like me as a kid, um, it's quite possible that you burnt out quite a few of your, um, dopamine receptors so maybe it's that but i can tell you it's just been day two and like holy crap do i feel good and not in a stimulated way like stimulants just in a good mood want to do work so very happy about that um so marks from boyton or max from boyton hey max i'm heading up to delray tonight so i am in a good mood we have monique out in canada uh, my ex-wife wanted to go back home to Sudbury, and all the borders are closed. They're not letting Americans in. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, well, I think I naturally gravitate towards a low-grade depression, so I have to be careful of that. I think it runs in my family. Um, who knows? Uh, yep, that's it, Simon. And like I said, I'm not recommending anyone take it. I am not a doctor. This is a dangerous chemical. Uh, who knows what it does? But uh, anyway, that's what I am taking at the moment. Um, All right. So if I happen to automatically go into a coma as we're talking, um, (laughs) then maybe uh, maybe you can uh, call 911 for me or something. Uh, And uh, let's now dive in. I am going to go to my computer here. There we go. Uh, Why are you not seeing the screen? You should be seeing the screen. There. Okay. All right. All right. So let's go. All right. And then I think it's 
was it this? Command Alt Shift T. No, this. No, hold on. I'm trying to remember what screen I use to um, get rid of the overlays. Oh, no, not the overlays. Uh, show the utilities. Hide all utilities. There we go. All right. All right. Now, let me move. Oop. I wonder if I'll be in the way up there. Eh, we'll try that. You guys see see it okay? I assume so. I can't see you now, so I'm just going to assume it's okay. Uh, I didn't come up with the title, so we'll just kind of um, leave it from there. Um, but uh, actually, I should be able to go into presentation mode. Let's take a look. Yeah, there we go. All right. So we're talking about psychological growth hacks, right? Um, right. So these are just preliminary things. Now, this was an interesting slide. And I actually, maybe I will take my thing and I'll turn it to the, I will put myself in the lower left just so that we can see this. Okay. So this is how much money is being spent online. Uh, in 2006, it was 40 billion. In 2018, it's gone to 3 trillion. That is uh, a 75 times increase from 2006 to 2018 of, of the money being spent online. If you have an online business and you've been in business since around this time, or even around uh, up until right around here, which we're talking like, 2012, 13, the amount of growth that is being spent online, uh, a lot, most of this is going um, to online businesses, but not our online businesses. It's going to these online businesses, right? So you can see in 2000, and this was like to 2018, because I gave this presentation right at the end of 2018, but uh, the, the companies on the left were the biggest companies in 2000 and look at the companies that are the biggest companies on the in 2018 and what one thing you notice is that none of the companies on the left are on the right right and this is by market cap these are the biggest companies in the world kind of interesting how there's been a complete change and this is pre-covid right it'd probably be even more in 2013 the app market as far as what was spent on apps outpaced what Hollywood brought in worldwide. Uh, internet advertising has already surpassed TV advertising. And once again, this is all pre-COVID, right? So you would think a rising tide lifts all boats, right? That's what Kennedy said. That's what a lot of people said, but some businesses are crushing it, all right? This looks like it, I took it right outside the marina here. And, um, but others are struggling to survive. And what makes the difference? right? Is your business 70 times, 75 times bigger now than compared to not 2002, but actually 2006. Um, is your business one that is growing like the one on the left, or do you feel like you're the person on the right? Uh, do you feel like maybe you're being left out of this cash surge that's coming in online? But the good news is, is that you're not alone. Isn't that a nice picture? Uh, growing your business automatically by picking back, piggybacking a ride on internet's growth, um, a marketing process guaranteed to grow your business faster and bigger, do it once, get new customers every day for free for years to come. This is what I've done in my business. Um, meet entrepreneurs who already leverage this incredible strategy. Okay. I don't know where the, oh, okay. Cause I'm going to share some stories. Okay. So story number one, I think many of you have probably heard, but I would imagine most of you have not heard story number two. Two. So story number one, this is Jordan Lampert. He was a chemist and then an entrepreneur. He had dreams of building a very large business and he started his company called Lampert Pharmaceuticals. Lampert Pharmaceuticals, their, one of their early products was a surgical antiseptic and a disinfectant. Uh, they never really got sales more than off the ground a little bit. And they tried everything, and they tried everything for close to 30 years. 
They tried it as a disinfectant for medical operations. They tried it as an antibacterial for cuts, scrapes, and wounds. They used it as a, they tried to sell it as a floor cleaner, an aftershave, a foot cleaner, a cure for dandruff, a cure for gonorrhea, and many other remedies that it was sold as. Then uh, Jordan's son, Jerry, took over the business. He had a new marketing idea. He didn't want to focus on the product or the benefit. Instead, he wanted to create and then advertise a problem that the product that Lampert Pharmaceuticals had was the solution for. What he came up with was halitosis. Halitus, which is Latin for breath, and osis, which is Greek for disease. So the disease of bad breath. And the ads were like this. Halitosis makes you unpopular. It's unexcusable, but it can be immediate, instantly remedied. Right? Are you unpopular with your own children? Make sure that you don't have halitosis. It's inexcusable and unnecessary. Don't fool yourself. Right? Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Since halitosis never announces itself to the victim, you simply cannot know when you have it. He's not going to call. Go to bed. <laughs> He's not going to call, right? Or let the tie take her out because I won't. And in both of these pictures, obviously the women are attractive. However, they both have bad breath. And because of that, they ain't going to be getting that call tonight and they aren't going to be taken out except by the tide. When he did this, when his son did this, sales skyrocketed 70 times. Sorry, um, I converted these to Japanese and I don't remember what these numbers are. Um, I, yeah, someone could type them in and let everyone know. It went from 164 million yen or 165 million yen to close to 11 billion yen. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what, I don't even want to estimate, even though I do get paid in yen. Um, but yeah, I think it's like close to 100 to 1, something in that vicinity. Uh, Listerine did not make mouthwash as much as it made halitosis. Okay, that's story, we're going to go to story number two. I would imagine some of you have heard of story number one. But let me go back to live for a second here. Is this it? Where is... Okay, I think this is it. And now options, view window, bring uh, show all utility windows. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, so now I'm back on my screen. Did you guys see that presentation? what I've covered so far. I haven't heard, I haven't seen anyone comment, so I need to know what is going on. Never know if it's a delay or what. Um, all right. I also, I was talking to a, a new acquaintance of mine, Sam Davies. Um, all good. Cool. Uh, who, I don't want to tell you about, um, his overall strategy that I want him to fully develop more and then share it with you. Uh, it's rather new, but, um, oh, wow. First time Tim says, cool. Okay. So it's funny how like they all come in at the same time. Um, but Sam, I don't generally listen to a lot of audiobooks. I generally read a lot, you know, and then listen to my notes. But what Sam had a good idea for was listening to memoirs on uh audiobook which makes a lot of sense because then it's like a person telling you their stories um i'm gonna try that i think that's a pretty cool idea because you know with biographies and autobiographies it gives you more implicit learning um and uh can help build expertise better so i'm interested and in, uh in exploring that more thought i'd pass that along now that i'm getting uh um, I've gotten comments that you guys are seeing the slides. I'm going to go back now to the presentation. Let's do it. Okay. So this is the second entrepreneur 
or entrepreneurs, I imagine a lot of you do not know this story. So some of you, most of you didn't know the other story, but even less will know this story, I believe. Okay, so which is more rare, a ruby or a diamond? Anybody want to take a guess without looking on Google? Uh, which is more rare? Uh, with the delay, I don't know that I can wait, so I will proceed, but interested in what you guys think. Rubies are actually 40 times more rare than diamonds. Bill got it right. And who else got it right? Bill got it right. Andre's got it right. Uh, yeah, so diamonds are 40 times less rare than rubies. Diamonds do not last forever. They yellow over time and chip and fade, and they do lose their value over time, although diamonds are much more expensive than rubies, right? There is no tangible reason for the high price of diamonds. Uh, in 1888, the man on the left, Ernest Oppenheimer, uh, merged all the mines, the diamond mines that existed in 1888 and formed De Beers. And the cartel uh, fixed prices. They fixed supply, which therefore fixed prices. That's what a lot of people know, but they think that the story ends there and it doesn't even closely end there. In, so this was Ernest and his son, Harry Oppenheimer, uh, when he was running the business in 1938, so 50 years later, right? Yep, 50 years later, they had, uh, they were experiencing a problem, right? Uh, for the past 20 years, right? So from 30 to 50 years, uh, sales were down 50% and prices were down 80%. This is when they controlled supply. They still controlled supply. But if there's not enough demand, then it doesn't matter how limited you make the supply. So he contacted the Iyer Ad Agency in 1938. And this was in a memo uh, from the Iyer Ad Agency. We need to strengthen the association in the public's minds of diamonds with romance. Since young men buy over 90% of all engagement rings, it is crucial to inculcate in them the idea that diamonds are a gift of love the larger and finer the diamond the greater the expression of love similarly young women have to be encouraged to view diamonds as an integral part of any romantic courtship this is what they did they started giving diamonds to movie stars to use as symbols of love they put out stories and photos in newspapers and magazines reinforcing the link between diamonds and romance they sponsored radio programs radio programs about uh, trends towards diamonds that fem fashion designers were talking about. They organized a weekly column, Hollywood Personalities, that ran in the top 125 newspapers at the time with descriptions of the diamonds worn by movie stars. And check this one out. They arranged lecturers at high schools across the country. The presentation was on diamond engagement rings. For the boys, it was like how to pick out the right one and for women, for girls, it was like how to know what diamond. They were basically uh, brainwashing people. And this is uh, this was somewhat done by Edward Bernays was involved in this. Um, so this is kind of interesting, right? Like that this is how diamonds became popular. Um, so, all right. So three years later, sales were up 55%. So this is uh, also from memos from the advertising agency. The, the campaign had required the conception of a new form of advertising. There was no direct sale to be made. There was no brand name to be impressed on the public. There was simply an idea, the eternal emotional value surrounding the diamond. We spread the word of diamonds worn by stars in screen and stage, of screen and stage, by wives and daughters of political leaders, by any woman who can make the grocer's wife and the mechanic's wife and sweetheart say, she 
say, I wish I had what she has. Sorry about me blocking the space. This is one of the best copywriters of all time. Frances Garetti. Most people have never heard of her, but she wrote the campaign. Whoops. And I'm going to take my, let's see if I can just move myself for a second there. Okay. Uh, she wrote A Diamond is Forever for an advertising campaign for De Beers in 1947. And she wrote all the company's ads for 25 years. But De Beers, one of the other things that they're really good at is about is opening up new markets. And here's an article in the New York Times about that, that creating new markets is the genius of De Beers. Getting African-American men to wear bling works for them as well as their 1950s campaign to get Japanese brides to demand solitaires. So since I was in Japan, um, I thought it would be great to talk about what De Beers did in Japan. So I'm just moving my picture over. I would take it out, but then I don't know how to put it back. All right. So uh, diamonds are a visible sign of modern Western values. Ads and magazines showed beautiful women displaying their diamond rings in Western clothing involved in activities. Japanese women, such as bicycling, camping, yachting, swimming, or mountain climbing that defied Japanese traditions. In the background, everything in the picture were conspicuous foreign imports. The message was clear. Diamonds represent a sharp break with the Oriental past and a sign of entry into modern life. Look at that. In 1967, 5% of the brides were getting a wedding ring, right? A diamond wedding ring. By 1981, 60% of brides. Think about how big of a shift that is in just 14 years. That is insane. Today, Japanese men spend three to four months salary on their engagement ring. In the U.S., the average is two months. Here are the numbers. In the U.S., that's the first column. In 1940, only 10% of husbands bought their wives or fiancés or whatever you want to call it and a, and a, a diamond ring. In 1990, 80%. In Japan... In 1965, 5%. In 1995, 77%. In China, 1% in 1994. In 2010, 31%. A Diamond is Forever is ranked number one best advertising slogan ever created by Ad Age. De Beers created the idea that diamonds are rare, last forever, valuable, and are essential signs of esteem, love, and romance. What do you guys think about that? Is that pretty incredible? Like when you kind of begin to get a sense of what De Beers has really accomplished, that we equate a, a diamond ring with love when there is no, there's nothing inherent in a diamond that makes it special. It's not even rare. It's, it, you know, it's only controlled, right? A, a, a ruby which sells for, I think, a fraction of what a diamond sells for, is actually 40 times more rare. So, but it's not artificially inflated. Of course, um, uh, my daughter's, my, so what was cool about this was I, when I gave this presentation, total aside, I'm having an ADD moment, I apologize. Um, but I'm, I'm much more popular in Japan than I am in the US. You know, every once in a while someone recognizes me, um, you know, outside of like in my day to day life, right? Um, but in Japan, uh, there was a two hour line for my autograph and for people to take pictures with me. Uh, and what was so cool about that, that's, I've never had that many people uh, in my life. Um, but what was so cool about that was that my daughters were with me and they got to see this and they couldn't believe that there were people that would actually wait in line to take a picture with me. Um, which is kind of hilarious, but how impressive is that of what De Beers has basically done? I mean, I don't see how that doesn't make you look at wedding rings with like a twinge of being manipulated. Um, the, uh, oh wow. Mary Ellen, long time, no speak. I hope you're doing well. Um, 
so uh yeah so we've gone over listerine we've gone over to, to beers um i made myself number three you remember it's my presentation right i'm not claiming that i had anywhere near the impact of either of those two campaigns but what i did and what i've consistently done you could say was inspired by that that it was actually inspired by um to create demand where there wasn't any right um and yeah so let's go into it and then i can explain more All right. Number three. <laughs> of course, uh, I'm in Japan. Got to say I love Japan, but I do love Japan. Japan's a really cool place. Um, I've had uh, I've been there many times. I actually studied when I went to Harvard. That's what I studied. I studied Japanese. Uh, can't speak it to save my life now, but was able to barely communicate. Uh, OK, uh, when I spent uh, Christmas there back in. Nineteen. 1990, oh, 1993, 94. That's when I, I was already journaling. Well, so Hugo brought up a good point. Let me just kind of answer that. Like, so Hugo b said, uh, what caught my attention is that demand was created without branding. That's not really true, right? So in the first example, they created halitosis, but they were the ones that were the only ones who had Listerine that was specifically designed to fight halitosis, right? Um, that didn't prevent other people later on jumping on the bandwagon, but they had a blue ocean. With De Beers, they controlled all the supply, so they didn't have to brand it. If you're the only one that is like sells coaching, then you don't have to brand anything. You could just have to convince people that everyone needs to be coached, right? And then if you control all the coaching, you know, they come to you. So they did kind of brand it, but not in the way that you would say, right? When I first wrote the manifesto, which is, I think, what we'll get into. It's like I said, it's been a while since I did this presentation. But like people saw themselves as an opportunity seeker. There's only one program that turns opportunity seekers into strategic entrepreneurs. That's my program because I'm the one who defined what an opportunity seeker is. And I'm the one who defined what a strategic entrepreneur is. And so if you define yourself as an opportunity seeker, if you define yourself as in love and want to sh express it, you buy a diamond. If you're an opportunity seeker and you want to get out of it, you join BGS. Like that's kind of the idea. If you have bad breath, you buy Listerine, right? That's the idea. So yes, they didn't brand, but they built a desire or they built it. They hopefully I get to that. If not, I will pull away like how how this is all really done. All right, let's do that. Oh, let me get rid of that first. Yeah, let me just, sorry, guys. Where's my Jamie, my producer? <laughs> um, okay, so this is just my story. We don't need to get into it. Uh, some articles about me, blah, blah. 9-11, um, lost lots of money. Love direct response, hated having employees, had to start over again. I got seduced by the internet lifestyle. You've probably heard this story. Here's some old stuff of mine, by the way, just out of fun things. Here's four different products that I had. I did a poker fantasy camp with Howard Letterer um, and a bunch of the other big, uh, all the guys that created Full Tilt because they wanted me to do Full Tilt with them. Um, and then... Uh, a golf product on the lower right, a product that helps people get refunds from uh, unethical companies on the left, bottom left, and baby model secrets on the upper left. These were all kinds of ebooks I did when I first started. All right. Uh, okay, so this goes into my whole story. I was on my laptop 24 7, although that's not me. Uh, I didn't get sleep. Okay, I uh, had information overload. All right, I'm going to scroll past a lot of these. See. Um, Right. Okay. Yep. So I'm just going to this part. Then I want to talk about, um, what's really involved. Um, all right. So, you know, this is 
I, I had worked with my 25 clients, right? I'd worked with Mike Phil Shane. I'd worked with Ryan Dice. I'd worked with all these guys. Um, but at that moment, when I was ending my coaching program, there was no, no one wanted coaching in business, right? Like, and I felt like I had invented the wheel and everyone was too busy and every like to actually notice. And not only that, but like I made everyone who was in my coaching program very wealthy, like in the field that all these other people wanted to get wealthy in. And yet I couldn't convince them they weren't interested in. They wouldn't even give me a second thought as related to learning about business because they didn't see how that would help them achieve their goal, right? So I think I've told you guys one night I had this, um, let's go back to me for a second, I guess. Had this, uh, had this conversation with Mark Ford and uh, it was at the cigar bar and we were talking about um, marketing and coming up with theories of what marketing is. And there's a million definitions of marketing. And this is just something I like to do like, uh, and it's something that Mark likes to do. So it's something that we've often done together. Um, and we came up with this idea. I don't remember if it was mine or his, let's say it was his, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, and that if you're selling something and you're like an ethical person, you're selling something cause you believe in it, that you believe that your prospects lives would be better if they had this, or at least some of your prospects, right? The people that the product was designed for. Um, not that you believe in it because you're selling it, but that you sell it because you believe in it, right? Big difference there. And the, and if you do believe in it and that's why you sell it, right? Then you've had certain experiences that have led you to the conclusion of whatever beliefs you have about the product, about the category, about those things. That's what's led you to the conclusion that your prospects would benefit. Well, guess what? Your prospects have not had those experiences, so they don't come to the same conclusion. So I came to this conclusion, right? That having, uh, understanding business is what's required to really make money online. And, uh, and I had a lot of experiences that that's kind of why I was sharing my life story there. Uh, I had lots of experiences that led me to that conclusion, but most of the people in my market did not have those experiences. Therefore they didn't have that conclusion. So one way of looking at marketing is, and it, can you give people an accelerated way to come to the same conclusion that you did? And if you want another word for conclusion, it's belief. So ultimately, Eugene Schwartz, who wrote the book Breakthrough Advertising, uh, he said that you cannot create desire. You can only channel it. And I agree with him. I think that you can only channel desire, right? You cannot create it. But we all walk around with lots of desires, unfulfilled all the time. We're desiring beings. That's what we do. Like the hedonic treadmill ensures that whatever we get today, in a month, in two weeks from now, in two months from now, at some point, it's not enough, right? It's never enough. We want more. And so... We are creatures who desire. Now, what we desire is based on what we believe. There's no, there, there's nothing else, right? Like we have these pre-built desires as an animal, right? But how we seek to fulfill those desires, right, um, is based on Beliefs about ourselves, beliefs about the world, beliefs about everything, right? You know, some, right, like, I, I could pick any topic, really, and you can look at why someone does what they do. What you'll find are, is that there are beliefs under it. And so, you know, there are, according to Stephen Reese, 
who's a was a professor at Dartmouth, then at Ohio State. Uh, he just recently passed away. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, The Normal Personality. He cr- I, he wrote a couple other books that I've read. I don't remember them off the top of my head. He also created the Reese Motiv- Motivation Profile, I think, or Index Pro- the Reese Motivational something. But if you type in RM Reese Motivational, you'll see it. And it was a test for companies that could test the personalities of people. And it was based on the 16 core human desires that we all have. And your personality is an expression of which of your desires are you off the bell curve. So either they're weaker than average or they're stronger than average. So I've given this example before, but just in case, like, let's say you have a strong biological built in desire for power. But think about power as like really a somewhat vague kind of thing. Like what is power and what are all the ways to have power? Well, if you become a police officer, you have power. If you become really strong and become like a bodybuilder, you have power. If you become the CEO of a company, you have power. If you become the mayor of your community, you have power, right? So if you're a great athlete, you have power. Like, Everyone has their own beliefs about what, like, what's the path to power. And then if you have a strong desire for power, then you will start taking action on those beliefs, right? And you have beliefs layered on top of beliefs. So you have this belief, right? Let's say that I have this belief that being the CEO of a big company would make me extremely powerful. And I have an extremely strong desire for power. So I have this belief that that is the height of power being the CEO of a multinational, right? If that's the case, I call that a primary belief, by the way, like or core belief. These are core. It's gonna be very hard for anyone to change my mind about that, right? Like that's deep. Because I've also built on top of that belief that being the head of a multinational is true power. Lots of different ideas about how to get there. And I have certain beliefs about that. I call those, you can call those secondary, right? Secondary beliefs. So those are important. Primary core, let's call them core versus secondary, okay? So when I write a report, right? And I'm writing to a group of people like the manifesto. I'm writing to people who want to make money online. And from the coaching conversations I had with people, from my sense of the market, et cetera, uh, the three desires that I kind of drilled down the manifesto to was autonomy, right? Uh, Autonomy security, like an autonomy is freedom in any which way. Security is financially secure, right? And respect, admiration, right? To have others appreciate that you have succeeded. So those are the three, right? Now, the people that I was speaking to in the manifesto are people that have already decided that in order to get security, financial freedom, right, autonomy, the freedom to live their life the way they want, and the recognition and respect of the people around them, that they want to have, they want to make money online, right? They've already decided that. It would be harder for me to get those people to then decide to do real estate investing or Forex trading or something else. It's possible. It's doable. It's just more work, right? Because those, this is their core belief. They believe that this is what has set the direction. Now, we're all in online marketing and we all have different ideas about how we should proceed in online marketing, what we need what we need to have, what we need to accomplish in order to achieve the results that we want, right? Some people need need to believe they need, they must have a list. Some people are like, I must have a specific type of funnel. I must have a best-selling product. I must do a launch. I must, whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter. Those are your secondary beliefs. Your core belief is 
online is the way to do it. Your secondary beliefs are the way that you're going to get it done. It, you can look at all my reports and you can see that it's those secondary beliefs that I, I twist. I twist them. I change them. And by doing that, right, like I am showing people a different way to fulfill their desires. Now, if you've heard me talk, you've read my stuff, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, then you recognize how this integrates with my view of markets and my view of a market, just for those of you who are not somewhat new to me or don't remember or never heard it. Um, my belief of a market is, is that it's just a group of people who share a conflict and, and the conflict could be a problem that they've been unable to resolve, right? Get rid of, or a goal that they've been unable to attain to get right. And the only reason that they're in the market is because they have that conflict, either that goal unattained, that problem unresolved, they have this conflict and the majority of people did not get into the market yesterday, right? They've been there for some time. They've tried things. So they've tried things based on their secondary beliefs to fulfill their core beliefs. And yet they have not been successful. And so their secondary beliefs are less firm. Does that make sense that they're still like in talking about us, we're still committed to making money online, but we're now we're not sure because we've done all the things that we believe, but we're not getting there. Something is in our way. We can't understand it. If you want to show someone you love them, buy them a diamond ring. Very simple, right? If you want to get rid of all the issues that an, being an opportunity seeker causes, then you need to get business coaching. You need to leave that, right? So this is just one of the easiest ways, right, to understand what someone truly believes is look at the actions they take. And based on the actions you, they take, you can determine what someone must believe is true. Once you understand what they believe is true and you know what their outcome is based on the market that they're in, you now have all the raw ingredients you need to have a message that addresses the elements that we just talked about. Does that make sense? So let me know in the comments. I'm going to go back to, well, yeah, let me know in the comments. I didn't even realize I'm still in this uh, talking to you directly. And I appreciate the uh, thumbs up. Obviously, I'm getting text here. Let me turn this off real quick. Um, maybe this will be a shorter uh, live stream than normal. Maybe I'll just do an hour today. Up to you. Um Let's see what everyone's got to say here. Okay, so yes, everyone, a lot of people thought rubies. That's interesting. Um, I wouldn't have thought so. All right, so tell me if this brings up any questions for you. Because, okay, yeah, so Carlos said, Reese motivation profile, yep. Okay, Jane said, yes, this makes sense. So simple, but at the same time, powerful, deep, and complex. Yeah, simple to understand, not necessarily simple to do. Uh, big yes, excellent. Total sense. Totally. Cool. Yes. Uh, you're welcome, Christian. That's an interesting way of spelling Christian. I haven't seen that before. I uh, love it. Cool. Uh, Mina. Yes, it makes sense. Cool. Makes so much sense. Cool. Uh, makes sense understanding the underlying forces of action. No, don't stop now. Well, Milos asked me a question. I'd be glad to answer it out of the park. Okay, cool. Um, so many notes. Cool. 
Uh, definitely been trying to create demand for my stuff. Okay, cool. So let's talk about how you do that. Um, you know, throw me a question here and I'll be glad to answer it. Um, all right. Do you have or could share a model to map out a chain of beliefs that my ideal customer has to acquire for them to get to the conclusion that they must get my product? Um, well, you go backwards. Um, so, um, you work backwards, you start there and what must they believe right before that? And what must they believe right before that? And what must they believe right before that? So that's kind of the, the idea, uh, Andre. Um, but if you tell me more, I might be able to do more. Um, I'm not sure what Pat is saying here. Pat says, yes, over 80% of small business owners resist planning, finally found a way to, okay. Maybe you were talking to me. Maybe you were talking to someone else. Um, so there are, we are fucked with all the time, myself included. Like we are bombarded by messages that help connect inherent desires that we have with, you know, things out in the world, but the things out in the world, the connection there is tenuous at best and, and more so, uh, established through agreement than anything else. Um, all right. So, uh, let's see, Sid, uh, late, but loving it. I'll catch it up after also i know that some of the greatest fortunes have been made at times like these and actually helping people versus scamming uh that interests me also for pure curiosity as well as wanting to build an empire to be able to go direct into helping on a major level to get our world back into peace okay well we've spoken about that before i can remind people but i would imagine that you can put together their points of failure and use that to create possible points of action that can take they can take to help them. That's true. You can also use it in a way that's really, um, powerful. Okay. So Milo says, how do you decide to, to fulfill an existing need or create a new demand? Okay. Well, so it's always going to be easier to sell people what they want, right? Um, unfortunately in certain fields, and I would consider online to be part of it, there are certain fields where, uh, people might want things that in the end are kind of false. They're false promises, right? Yes. I would like to buy something today that I can pay $2,000 for that pays me $2,000 a month for the rest of my life or pays me 10,000 or whatever, like whatever promise you find on whatever scammy website that is making them. Of course we want that. So what I've done is I've, I've done it where I created new demand primarily so that I can have some space to have like a blue ocean for some period of time. Like when I first started business coaching online, there was nobody. It took three years for Eben Pagan to come and like, f f uh, follow in my wake. Right. Um, I don't know how many years it took for other people to develop theory of constraints courses for, you know, online entrepreneurs. I don't know if there even is one now. Um, so I've done it where it's things like what we were talking about, Milos, where things that I truly believe in, right? That I know that I've been convinced and then take that message and convince others. And, you know, that's also part of my personality. Like if I go get a great massage today, I want to tell people about it tomorrow. Like that's just naturally what I do. So, you know, I like to kind of share that kind of stuff. So because of that, um, it's, quite naturally that I evolved to something like this because evolving to something like this was basically just sharing with people how I had been convinced. Right. And fortunately I have a journal and I can review like how I was convinced. So I don't even, it's not even a mental exercise. It's actually true. So 
that's what I've done. Now, the benefit of it is, is that you have no competition. The negative of it is, is that you will always have to market to make sales. But if your marketing's in place and it's evergreen, you will continually make sales. That's the difference. And the reason why is, is that there is no pre-built demand for it. You know, no one's typing in transform, you know, how do I transform from an opportunity seeker into an entrepreneur? Nobody asks that. There's zero keyword research for that. So I have to first get people to be like, holy shit, I'm an, I'm a, I'm operating like a, an opportunity seeker. How the hell do I fix this? Right. That's or, oh, my God, like my business is being weighed down by constraints. I need to figure out what they are. So that's kind of the idea there. And for those of you who are in Steel Our Winners, there is that 90 minute um, behind the scenes presentation where I did kind of spur of the moment for some clients that were in my office, a 90 minute presentation about creating demand where I go into a lot more depth than I went in today because today I was really kind of telling stories about demand creation where as in Steel Our Winners in that bonus, um, I walked you through the steps that I actually used to do it. Um, but there's also, you know, I wrote a report. I haven't released it. Um, the report really uh, differentiates people into marketers into two groups, uh, demand chasers and demand creators. And most people, most of the time, do demand chasing. And demand cha there's nothing wrong with demand chasing. Demand chasing is throw an ad out. Take someone into your funnel, sell them, right? Um, there's more people have probably made money demand chasing than demand creating. But uh, in this online environment where we are all connected, we're all competing with one another, and we're all therefore have the same tools. You know, you can use click funnels whether you live in India, you live in Japan, or you live in the United States, or you live in some third world country. And you're just trying to make a dollar a day and you'd live like, well, all these people can use those tools. All these people are willing to create or steal and, you know, whatever. So the longer game is to be able to take people and create demand. Now, it's not easy. And, uh... And it can't be based on bullshit because uh, people will hate you um, if you take them down a road that's completely fruitless and you are a horrible person if you do that. Um, but it's if you're for someone like me, there's no choice. I like to do things differently right out of the get go. Just I like being different. Right. Um, so. For that reason, like I'm always going to try something other than what everyone else is doing. It's my own flaw, really. Um, but because of that, it allows me to create products that other people aren't creating and therefore market them in a way that other people aren't marketing them. And so when I first wrote my report and I saw that effect and I saw that result, that's why I wrote so many reports like in my first 18 months. Because I had this magical power and I still can do it, but I had this like newfound power of creating demand for products that I really believed in, but the world had not come to that conclusion. All right. So when you map that out, how do you figure out the best way to drive them to the conclusion? Do you write a report, a webinar, VSL? Also, do you talk about all the secondary beliefs or should you tackle just one or two at a time? Um, I think you're looking at it like pull back a little bit. Um, you're looking at it like a little bit too myopically. Um, First of all, if you have a message that when people are exposed to it, their mind changes and they see your product in a new light, I would put that in as many formats as you possibly could. I wouldn't limit it to just one, right? I would try and get it in, I would try and get it to people in as many ways as possible. This is not done overtly. This is done covertly. Uh, a something that I've been known to say often, right? I was going to say something that I'm known to say for, but that would assume that a lot of people know what I'm saying all the time, which is probably not true, um, is that uh, revelation before explanation. I 
desperately want someone who is consuming some of my marketing to come to the conclusion way before I tell them the conclusion. Because if they come to the conclusion, if they have the epiphany, the aha, the, oh my God, now I've just, I, I get it. Before I explain it, then it's their idea. And now I'm just confirmation that they're right, which is great. If I have to explain it, it's better than nothing, but it isn't as good as they having the idea themselves. So what I try and do is I lead someone to the revelation. I will then give an explanation just in case they didn't get it or to confirm it, but I'm really trying for them to get it first. I hope that makes sense for you guys. Now, I'll give you, uh, okay, I got two things I'm going to share, answer questions. We might end early. I'm renting a car so I can go to Delray, and I'm very excited about that. Um, I might teach you crystallization. We'll see. And the sexiest idea of all time. Okay. Just making a note to myself so I don't forget. All right. First question, Sam. Cool. Thanks, Pat. Sorry, I have to go. We'll listen to the replay. So true. Uh, that, of course, reality is XYZ is a mutual agreement of terms, not necessarily reality. True. Yeah, that's my whole idea, right? Reality is a lot more complicated than we understand. Uh, what models do you use to map their needs and desires? Maslow, Reese, anything else? Um, well, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so I'll get back to you. Well, let me tell you now. Um, I don't, I map their problems. I take their problems and I map them out. And I, I go deeper into their problems. I want to understand what manifests these problems because ideally I'm going to find a deeper problem that my solution handles because then I can make the argument that this solves all of these, not just that. And that's even more powerful. Does that, do you follow what I'm saying there, Milos? I know that that's a complicated answer, but I think you might get it. Um, if not, let me know and I'll explain. Uh, Mutual L type slower. My apologies. Um, uh, no, I have not seen the one you just earlier, but I study how toilet paper was marketed when it first came out and it shares a similar story on how it got noticed and sales got started. I did this because I thought this would be one of the hardest products to market out there. Charmin toilet paper took the market. They went to women to create demand. This was back when Sears Roebuck used to wipe your butt in the outhouse. Uh, they sold the comfort to women, surprised the crap out of me, what they went through. Interesting. Okay. Uh, do you suggest on the first page of a website showing problem first or solution first? I like the problem first, but if you state the problem first, do you put the solution as the headline or should you have state the solution later and have the problem as the headline? It really depends on the level of awareness uh, of your market. So if you're not familiar with level of, levels of awareness, do a search, uh, type in Eugene Schwartz, levels of awareness, breakthrough advertising, and it will go through that. Um, for the most part, um, the way I do it, and I'm not suggesting this is the only way or even the right way. There are lots of ways to do this. Um, but what I've done is I start with what my prospect would say are the problems that are currently standing in their way from getting their result. So are you suffering from this, 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 this? Do you have this, 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 right? And so it's not about the problem and it's not about the solution. At that point, it's the symptoms. Like, so think about like, uh, any kind of advertisement for any kind of pain medication, cold medication, anything like that. What do they start with? They start with the symptoms. They don't even start with the cold. You know, do you have a runny nose, fever, like, you know, having a hard time sleeping, whatever, right? So that's what I start. You can't start with the solution because they don't even know they have a problem. And you can't start with the problem because they don't identify what the problem is. 
So if you're starting at the earliest stage, you're starting with what are the friction points that they're experiencing, if that makes sense. I hope it does. The point I make to the friend that teach me about your motto, you believe first in what you sell. Yes, for sure. <laughs> when is the report coming out? When I want to market that course. Um, yeah, I don't even know if this is public news, but I'm buying my business back from Agora. And uh, as I'm in the process of doing that, uh, I am going to relaunch BGS in a way where I go through it with a live cohort. Uh, that'll be within the next couple of weeks, I imagine. And then uh, the report will come out when uh, my next, when I want to release the marketing course, which will probably be sometime thereafter. Um, I'm on the demand creator side with our web platform startup. What is the most important thing to learn in creating demand? Well, it sounds trite, Ron, um, because I don't think it's that unusual of what I'm about to say, but it's, but let me explain why. Um, so what you really, there's nothing more important than understanding your prospect period. Um, I think one of the things that made me into a good marketer and I don't, well, certainly what made me a good marketer for uh, internet marketing, if you think I am, uh, is, uh, was all the coaching I did. And one of the reasons I want to do coaching again, uh, is that there's, I don't know anything better than getting into the head of the market than coaching a bunch of people in the market. Because when you're coaching people, they have to be open with you. They they open up in front of you in order for you to help them. So you you understand what their deepest concerns are, what their challenges are, what they worry about. And when you coach a lot of people, it's like you now know the deepest thoughts of the entire marketplace. Now, I believe this. This is these are just my beliefs, right? So that's what I believe. And now I'm going to share some other things I believe. Right. And I don't, this is like, I can't, I don't have any proof of any of these things. These are just like what I'm sharing, right. Based on my experience. Um, but my belief is, is that one of the earliest and most difficult obstacles or objections to get over with your sales message and a prospect that comes across it is the prospect thinking this isn't for me, this doesn't apply to me or something to that effect, right? That this is not for me. I think that's one of the biggest, uh, everybody thinks they're, they're unique, right? Everyone thinks they're special. Everyone thinks their business problem is unique. Dan Kennedy used to have a sign behind him, right? That said, uh, my business is different. He had it at the back of his uh, seminar because he wanted um, he wanted to point to it every time he heard it because that's what everybody says. My business is different. We're all different, but we all operate on the same psychology, right? So, so when and I don't know if you've ever had some of you probably did some well some of you probably have some of you probably haven't but I don't know if for those of you who've had this experience, it's powerful. If you've ever read a book and you felt like that book was written for you, like, oh my God, they're describing me. Oh my God, like, I can't believe this. If you've ever had that experience, that book becomes a page turner. There's nothing more interesting in your life in that moment than that book. Why do we take personality tests? Why do we like, you know, why do we take any test about ourselves? Why do we look at ourselves first in every picture? <laughs> um, so because of that, right, um, I think empathy is the most important thing, because if you can describe your prospect situation where the conflict resides, right, you've got them. Because most people feel completely misunderstood and they reject most things as not applying to me. And I gave this example. Maybe this will help. Um, I gave this example to Mark Ford as I was describing this concept, this part. 
right? Marx had numerous businesses um, in uh, nine figures, even a 10 figure business, right? Yeah. Seven, eight, nine, 10 figures. Um, the biggest business I've had is about 20 million bucks that I've owned personally, right? Um, never had a business bigger than that. And I have a lot of beliefs about like who I am as a person <laughs> that says I probably shouldn't have a business bigger than that. I'm a little bit flaky or a lot flaky, depending on the time. I am much more big picture oriented, not so great on the details. Uh, I avoid conflict until I seek it out. I have a lot of reasons why I probably don't have a bigger company. So if Mark Ford came to me, someone who has built numerous companies way bigger than mine, has helped lots of people build companies bigger than mine. And he said to me, Rich, I know strategic profits could be a hundred million dollar business. I might say to him, you might be right, but not with me at the, on top. Right. Um, and it has nothing to do with Mark. I know he has the ability to. I know he's done it before. I know he could probably do it again. But I don't have belief in myself. Right. So build a business to one hundred million dollars. One, I'm not that interested in it. But even if I was interested in it, maybe I'm not interested in it because I've resigned myself to only have a twenty million dollar business or whatever. And don't get the numbers are completely unimportant in this. I'm just kind of giving you an example. So if Mark said to me, like, look, I, you could have a $100 million business, I'd be like, mm. in the back of my mind, I'm thinking Mark wouldn't say that to me if he knew the real Rich Sheffern. If he knew how flaky he was, I was, if he knew how much I procrastinated, if he knew how much I avoid confrontation, if he knows there are certain days I just don't feel like working, if he know, like, you know, he wouldn't say this to me. But now imagine if Mark said to me, look, I know you're kind of flaky. I know you avoid confrontation. I know that like there are days you don't even show up at work. Let me tell you why all those things would actually help you build a hundred million dollar company, not hurt you. When you avoid confrontation, you really, it's easier to become the figurehead, the person that everyone loves, believes in, in charge of the business and have a right hand person who is the heavy. It's actually works out much better that way. You know, and he starts going through all these things of what I think is bad about myself that prevents me he says is good and will actually get me there faster. He will immediately overcome all the objections I have. Hence, to answer your question, I think that the strongest thing when it comes to creating demand is to understand where, where it hurts for your prospects. Uh, Hugo wants to know where I can find the hidden obstacles report. You can find the hidden obstacles report here in our Facebook group. It's announcement number one or two, um, for free instead of the 97 bucks it once was. So my gift, just join the Facebook group. Um, yep. And Mila said strategic profits group, as Carla said in the strategic profits group. Um, Okay, he, who here knows PFAS, PFOA, POFOS? Now, how would you go about creating demand in areas of the country that know they have, I don't know what PFAS is. Oh, okay. Don't know, Sandy. I'm not going to look it up right now. Thinking pattern. Your response to Milos was so powerful. Oh, thank you. I got it. I get it. I asked because I always come back to Maslow and then I analyze problems. I thought there may be a model that you use that I didn't hear before because Reese is relatively new to me. Yeah, Reese wasn't really well known. Um, but when everyone, well, not everyone, when I, whenever I read about desire, I, you know, I'd see these lists like by copywriters, like the human desires. And I look, there is, there's, Knowledge that comes from doing it, and so that's valuable. I'm not negating that at all. But I wanted to see if there was any scientific research about desire. And the only scientific research I could find on desire, published papers, highly cited by other papers, you know, heavy-duty academic chops that also then, like, proved out to be something, was uh, Stephen Rees. Um, that was it. And, and, and if you're interested, uh, Milos, because you might be, 
Um, I haven't read the article yet. I saved it to my Evernote. But um, this guy talks about how like the the pyramid for Maslow was invented after Maslow died, and he would totally have disagreed with that. So, uh, like, uh, type in, like, Maslow's Pyramid of Myth, question mark, or if you can't find it, let me know, and I'll look at it in my Evernote. But I thought, I haven't read it, but I think you'll probably enjoy it. Um, All right. I read or heard somewhere, or from someone, (laughs) I can't remember who or where, and the person recommending writing 10 ideas every day, get the ideas flowing. Yeah, that's James Altucher's idea. Good idea. I love your own direct work. Okay, cool. Uh, I see the symptoms are subjective problems, current pains. The objective problem is always more abstract, a situational obstacle. Not sure, Milos. Uh, Yes, exactly, Bob. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you'll want to watch this one, Stefan. I think people have really enjoyed this one. Um, happens with every one of your reports, Rich. Oh, well, thanks, Andre. Uh, yep, Victor Schwab's book is a good start. How to write advertisements at work. Uh, Hugo, you're welcome. I love the conversation with Mark Ford example. Thank you. Question, how do we know we have identified the market's biggest pain point, the best way to confirm it? Well, the biggest pain point is the lack of the conflict being resolved. That's the biggest pain point, right? Um, It's that the conflict still exists. The problem is unresolved. The goal is still unattained. Now, so let me give, to make this, let's just see what else is here. And... um, Yep, this is the cave just posted the uh, thing about Maslow that I was mentioning to Milos. Uh, Maslow didn't make the pyramid that changed management history. Okay. Flipping the script. Yep. Uh, Orrin Claff, friend of mine. Like him. Uh, good book. And, uh, but yeah, I would recommend both books by Orrin. Crazy guy, but good, good reads. Uh, so, okay, so let me give you two other ideas, two other really powerful concepts, and um, then I will call it a day, okay? So the two things I'm going to talk about is crystallization, uh, extremely powerful tactic that I developed. Uh, if I say, So when I say extremely powerful, I guess I'm being a little bit arrogant. Um, let me now, uh, go back here and see if I can, oh, I don't want to end the, oh, I hope I didn't just stop. No, I didn't. Did I stop? I'm still broadcasting, right? Yeah, cool. (laughs) Um, I need to see if I have these slides on this, um, in this presentation. So bear with me one second here, guys. Um, so, so crystallization is based on this idea that the biggest, not biggest, um, I, that one of the most complete ways of expressing love to someone is to love about them what they hate about themselves, if that makes sense. All right. So in other words, whatever that person hates about themselves that you love that about them, right? Um, So let's take a look here now, see if I can, if I have these slides in here. All right. I don't see it here. So let me, so let me tell you about the other idea as I pull this up. So what is the, um, this is going to be in my notes. I'm looking for a, all right. Um, yeah. All right. So 
we went over everything that as far as like, well, everything. We went over a lot of like how I did it with the reports, right? And I want you to think of, okay, so someone is reading the report. They're watching it on video. It doesn't really matter how they're consuming the content. They have this conflict and they've been unable to get rid of the conflict. That's why they're still in the market. So if they're in IM, they're trying to make a certain amount of money, gain a certain amount of freedom, power, right? Like they have these beliefs, right? They're trying to do this. They're still not there. That's why they're in the market, right? So from that standpoint, what is the most easy to digest reason why someone is not there? Like if I were going to come to you having great empathy, sharing with you everything that you feel about yourself or you see about yourself, and then I was going to tell you the solution. Obviously, the solution cannot be do everything. You're 100% right. Keep doing everything you're doing, right? Can't be that. One, because they haven't achieved it. Two, that does not set up the need for them to buy anything from you. And odds are is that if they were on the right path, they'd already know that. So the best thing that you can tell someone is that everything they're doing is necessary, but not sufficient. That it is, you're just, you're doing everything right, but you're missing one piece. That's what I do, right? That's why I like Orrin Claff's flip the script book because he talks about how to do that. Um, not the way I'm talking about it, but what he talks about is how to take 20 things and make it one thing different. So for that alone, flip the script is well worth it because that's how you take everything and make it one thing. Um, so that's one, right? I'm going to give you an example of the second thing that I call crystallization. So that I can, uh, oh, I did have a lot more stuff in here. Oh, you know what? Let me show you a few other things real quick. And then I'll show you the crystallization. Because I actually did, um, yeah. Okay, so let me, let me run through a few different things here. Okay. I apologize. Some of these you've probably seen before if you've seen some of my presentations, but it will make sense. Okay. So th there's a difference between marketing and selling. Most entrepreneurs don't know the difference, right? It's kind of a problem because if you don't know what the difference is, how do you know when you're doing one or the other? How do you know when you transition from marketing to selling? It's kind of problematic. Most people don't and therefore make lots of mistakes, right? The goal of marketing is to make selling superfluous. That is the goal of marketing, right? Uh, Apple's one of the greatest marketers in the world. You walk into the store pre, just like pre, pre-sold. No one's trying to sell you anything in the Apple store, right? What I believe selling is really all about at the end of the day is having someone move in the direction of their desires based on the beliefs they have, right? So you're moving someone out of status quo. It's kind of like I, I'm losing weight right now. Why am I losing weight right now? Because my weight got to a certain point where then I needed to do something about it. Um, as I was gaining weight, it bothered me that I was gaining weight, but it didn't bother me enough until I overcame status quo bias and then I took action. We all walk around with lots of things we'd like to change about ourselves, that we'd like to be different, but we stay in the status quo until something pushes us out. When we get pushed out of status quo, we then make a decision that is based on the beliefs that we have. So what... I, this, and once again, this is just my model, right? Like there's not a place you can go look this up and look at a chart unless you've seen someone create a chart based on what I'm talking about. My belief is, right, is that marketing sets up the beliefs. And then when the beliefs are entrenched, right, that like now when they decide to take action on that thing, because we're going to push them out of status quo, they're going to act on the beliefs that they have. And those beliefs point them to our product if that makes sense. So when we're in status quo, we do nothing. When we get pushed out of status quo bias, we do whatever we can. Uh, most entrepreneurs don't market enough and instead they try to sell too much, which has them come out looking like this because they try and sell way more than they try and market, 
right? When you market more than you sell, you get lots of fans, right? It's easier to change beliefs outside of a sales environment. Once someone knows you're trying to sell them, they have their guard up. They will prevent it. They will distrust and analyze everything that you're saying. Critical factor bypass is where you get past that, where someone is not analyzing everything that you're saying and debating whether it's true or not. It, when you're in school uh, and you're, you know, you're being taught, you're not consciously analyzing what's being said to you. When you're in a hypnosis session, you're not critically analyzing what's being said to you. If you're at a seminar and you have trust in the person teaching, you achieve critical factor bypass. If you're distracted, you can create critical factor bypass. Um, critical factor bypass means it's easier to get a belief in because it's not being consciously analyzed and critical factor is way up in a sales situation. All right. Yeah. So these were the different points I covered in this presentation. Not going to obviously cover them all, but here's the whole idea about market or niche defined by a conflict. The conflict is a goal unattained, a problem unresolved. A market is just a group of people that share an unresolved conflict and that they've been struggling with that conflict for some time, or they would not be in the market, right? Um, so why is this going to work when nothing else I've tried has, right? Like you have to have an answer for that. And the way you have an answer for that is that one, you match them where they are. You explain to them their situation and what they're struggling with, right? And then you provide them with something that's different because different is better than better, right? Okay, this is nothing I haven't told you. All right, there's Stephen Reese. This is the Reese profile. This is how everyone's desires are, right? For the most part. Right, so if you have a strong, if you have strong in the desire for power, you have a desire to lead, influence, take responsibility, right? If you have a weak desire for power. You're uncomfortable leading, influencing. You're much more comfortable following, right? Like this should make sense. So I'm just, this is from the Reese motivation profile, right? Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, hold this and that show. Hold on. All right. Um, what I wanted to show you was something at the very beginning, I guess. Sorry. Um, what I wanted to show you was this. Mm, not that. Sorry. All right. When I tell my story, which is not the full story. Okay. So generally, like in my BGS presentation, for example, I go through how I was successful offline, right? Here's stories about my store, doing 7 million bucks a year, Madonna, Bon Jovi, Eric Clapton, all these people shopping at it, right? Here's my hypnosis centers in Cranes doing 13 million, heading towards 13 million that year. Then 9-11 happened. My business went down the toilet, right? I had to start over. And now I was seduced into uh, the internet lifestyle. I bought into that belief, right? I was unsure of which tactics to use. I was working 24-7. I didn't sleep for days. I was consuming so much I had information overload. Everything seemed like it took more time and ended up with less results than I was promised, right? Never got the results I was hoped for. Started asking what's wrong with me. Uh, Self-doubt sleeps in. St you know, where did it all go wrong, right? Now, I'm just looking at, this is where it all went wrong, huh? Okay. So, I want you to look at all these though, and I like, like, so let's look at this one, right? No sleep sometimes for days. So pulling all nighters now, every, so these were the behaviors that I was displaying that caused me to struggle. And these were behaviors when I created this original presentation all the way back in like 2006, 
um, that my audience was also struggling with. So I'm saying that in my past I did this, and I know that many of the people who are I'm communicating with are doing this right now, right? Not today, but then. Behind every behavior is a positive intent. Even doing drugs, the positive intent is to feel good. So this is a behavior. No sleep sometimes for days, right? What if I told you that no sleep for days while causing a challenge in this business was actually driven by the same success characteristics that actually caused my success offline because offline what this translated into was me being willing to do whatever it takes but being willing to do whatever it takes when you're following the wrong strategy has you not sleeping sometimes for days right has you working 24 7 unsure of which marketing tactics to use proves that you're willing to find what works best and the desire to find what works best when I was offline had me pick the best tactics to use, right? But following this opportunity seeking strategy has me just unsure consistently as I jump from thing to thing to thing. So my point is, is that as I'm, what I'm trying to do without having the actual slides in front of me is to walk you through what crystallization is. Crystallization is proving that the things that your prospect believes are currently standing in their way are actually not standing in their way, but they're actually gr things that express greatness about them, but only greatness when it's properly applied, problems when they're misappropriately applied. Let me know if that makes sense. If it does, let me know what your thoughts are about that, and then we will wrap it up. Yep. So I did. I delivered crystallization and what I believe is the sexiest uh, idea as far as if you want to sell an idea. The idea is you're doing everything right. You just are missing one thing. Cool, Chris. Uh, enjoy your Instagram live. I was on your live stream with like Cam and a few other people and uh, don't know if anyone else was there, but I was trying to get your guys' attention. Makes total sense. Cool. All right, guys. Um, yeah, so we'll end a little early today. I don't, I don't know if that makes me a bad person or if that's a problem, uh, but uh, um, hopefully not. Mary Ellen, it's great to see you. It's a long time since we've spoken. Um, amazing, cool, uh, brilliant. Uh, is what I think about that process because it's real. Cool. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, Ron, uh, if you're going to listen to it all completely again, um, you can watch it here. It'll be on my page, right, where my videos are. It'll also be on YouTube. I'd love it if you watch it on YouTube. I'd actually enjoy if most of you would subscribe to my YouTube channel because I want to start growing that. Um, so I will also, uh, put a link to that in the Facebook group. The, um, also I will be doing Thursday's live stream from Delray beach. I am so excited. I haven't been to Delray, uh, since I did my live stream since February. Wow. God, it was so different then. Um, anyway, so, uh, quick recap here. So what did we go over? We talked about how there's a good possibility, right? That, that what we've experienced over the last couple of years was really like the high point for overall consumer demand that like there's a, a very good case can be made that we're not going to experience overall economically the same level of demand for the coming couple months, years than we've had up until now, right? Where we had all of the world working and right now we don't. So with that kind of thought in mind, the idea is maybe you should start thinking about, if nothing more, creating demand. And what is involved in creating demand? Well, what's involved in creating demand at the end of the day is recognizing that your prospect has certain desires and those desires get expressed in behavior based on beliefs. So as a marketer who is attempting 
to channel the desires of their prospects and to demand for specific products, the only tool that we have to really work with is the tool of belief, right? Beliefs generally get formed through epiphanies, ahas, revelations, like, oh my God, and evidence, right? My marketing is the evidence. What I'm teaching, another way that I like to kind of explain marketing is marketing is teaching your prospects how to value your product, right? Like my prospects didn't value business coaching because they didn't see it as the solution to their conflict because they didn't understand how it eliminated what they were defining as problems that I defined as symptoms of some deeper problem, that deeper problem being opportunity seeking. If you follow all that, then you understand that you want to be in the game of marketing. You want to create content that shifts beliefs. And the way you do that is you lead people to a conclusion just the same way you've been convinced of whatever you've been convinced with in your life. Right. I have certain friends that I believe would be there through thick and thin that like no matter what happened to me, I could rely on them. And then I have some friends that I, I don't believe that. And the only difference between those two are the experiences I've had with those two that have led me to those conclusions. Right. So understand that if you don't understand what your prospects currently believe, then look at their current behavior. What do they comment on? What do they buy? What must be true in order for them to do that? That's what you got to ask yourself. And then you reverse it. And the sexiest belief, right, to get someone to believe if they're struggling with a conflict is that they're doing everything right. There's just missing one thing. So uh, as you guys know, I do these live streams every Tuesday and Thursday. Absolutely free. I uh, love having you guys here. I'm lonely as crap. I'm in this big apartment completely by myself. It's why I'm going to Delray. This is my only outlet to talk to other people. Um, so I appreciate each and every one of you. I thank you. So I, you might be appreciative of me for teaching and I get it. I'm very appreciative of you for listening. Uh, I literally would go out of my mind if I didn't have people to share what fascinates me, what interests me uh, with because uh, it would just be really shitty. And uh, as a introvert that needs other people around, I'm like a weird person that way. Um, I've been really struggling. And it, these live streams are some, one of the things that I really look forward to. So seriously, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for interacting with me. Thank you for asking questions. If you shared it, thank you for that. If you're a member of our group, thank you for that. Um, and like I said, I'm just really excited. I'm getting to go home today uh, for the first time in, God, in months. And I get to see my youngest daughter too. So I'm excited about that. So uh, with that said, uh, to higher profits and beyond, this is Rich Sheffern over and out. I'll see everyone on Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern.